2012, the iPhone 5 is announced with iOS 6, the last iOS iteration of the Steve Jobs era. Everything about the iPhone 5 represented what Steve Jobs wanted in a phone. It was innovative, functional, and pushed the limits of what a smartphone could do and be. And a year later, this all changed. 2013, the iPhone 5S is released alongside a phone that appeared to be basically a reskinned iPhone 5. While the 5S continued to push innovation, albeit less so than the 5 with really only Touch ID and a 64-bit architecture as new features, the 5C stayed at a standstill, made only to replace the year-old iPhone 5. The iPhone 5C is plastic, the 5 aluminum. Other than that, they're virtually identical. Same screen, same specs, same everything. And yet, these are not the same phone. On the surface, they might appear to be, but they differ in what each represents. Hey, how's it going? I am Josh from 91Tech, and today we're going to be talking about how the iPhone 5 and 5C are two very different phones. The iPhone 5 and 5C are interesting because despite only a year apart in release, they both symbolize two completely different market strategies for Apple. The iPhone 5 at release was the perfect upgrade the iPhone lineup needed. It gave a slightly larger size without being too big, and fixed the issues people had with the 4 and 4S. While the glass back on the 4 looked brilliant and was really ahead of its time, it was just that, ahead of its time. Because it really served no practical purpose with wireless charging not being a thing yet, Apple got rid of it in favor of the durability that aluminum brought. It was super common to see a cracked iPhone 4 or 4S, seriously, they were everywhere, and so Apple worked to fix that with the 5, and they did. The iPhone 5 is a design so good that it's still being used today with the iPhone SE. The iPhone 5 continued to push the limits of weight and size, being the thinnest iPhone ever at the time, as well as the lightest, and it's still the lightest today. The iPhone 4 kind of felt like a brick in comparison, and in 2012 it was hard to imagine a more compact device. The iPhone 5 also really boosted things in the spec department, bringing the still 30 32-bit A6 chipset and, and this is really what changed things, a full gigabyte of RAM as opposed to 512 megabytes. This provided much more processing power and drastically increased the longevity of the iPhone 5. It received updates from 2012 all the way to 2017. That was the most official support of any iPhone ever, or actually any smartphone ever, at least until the iPhone 5S, which is receiving iOS 12. And so let's quickly go over the iPhone 5S. The iPhone 5S was a typical S upgrade to the iPhone lineup. It pushed mobile devices forward with one of the first 64-bit architectures in the A7 chipset, and of course brought Touch ID, which would later become a staple on smartphones. And perhaps the most notable change of all wasn't even directly related to the 5S. The user interface was completely redesigned with iOS 7, and finally brought Apple completely out of the Steve Jobs era. So it doesn't really seem like the 5S brought a whole lot of new additions to the Apple lineup. I mean, unless you include iOS 7, which is arguably a fair thing to do. But even that aside, I think the iPhone 5S is a perfect good S upgrade. Looking back at the iPhone 3GS and 4S, we see that there really wasn't more added in each of these phones. There's a pretty similar pattern here. The 3GS brought a better camera that could record video and had better processing speeds. The 4S brought a much better camera, better speeds, and a dual core processor, as well as Siri. The iPhone 5S also brought better speeds, a 64-bit chipset, one of the first fingerprint sensors on a phone, and a completely redesigned UI. What am I saying here? Well, I think the iPhone 5S was a perfectly good upgrade to the iPhone 5 that would would have been in line with the direction Steve Jobs had maintained throughout his life. In fact, with Steve Jobs around, there probably would have been even less change, as iOS 7's redesign probably never would have happened. So the iPhone 5S was a good, solid phone for the time, and crazily enough, is still usable today. And that's where, if under Jobs, it would have ended. A nice upgrade with the iPhone 5S would have been introduced, and the iPhone 5 would have received a simple reduction in price. But Apple was no longer under Steve Jobs, and so the iPhone 5C was released alongside the 5S. While the 5S mostly falls in line with Apple's former business model, the 5C really shows the shift in leadership. The 5C didn't push anything forward. It shared all the same hardware as the iPhone 5, with the only real difference being that it was plastic, and therefore, in the minds of consumers, cheap. It didn't matter that overall the 5C really wasn't a terrible phone. After all, it was essentially the iPhone 5. It was still doomed to failure from the start, and I've done a video on whether or not the 5C was really a failure, and you can check that out if you want to. Don't get me wrong, by pure numbers, the 5C 
wasn't a failure whatsoever. After all, it was estimated by June 2014, Apple had sold over 24 million. And so, yeah, not really a failure there. Most companies would be thrilled if they sold as many phones as the 5C did. But context matters. This was Apple, not HTC or Motorola. For them, this was a flop. And why? Because Apple usually sells a lot more phones than that. And why didn't the 5C sell very well? Because it was overpriced. Like, really overpriced for what it was. Apple tried to sell it for $550 unlocked at launch, while the 5S went for only $650. Almost nobody in their right mind would go for the 5C when for only $100 more you could get the much more premium model. And yes, most people did buy the 5C on contract, so it didn't really cost $550 for most. But again, even the 5S on contract would only be about $100 more. It just wasn't worth it to get the 5C. The kicker in all this is that the iPhone 5, had it stuck around, would have costed $550. So you were essentially getting the same thing as the 5, except it was plastic, for the same amount of money. Hopefully you can see the issue here. Alright, so Apple got cheaper after Jobs. Not a huge surprise. But is that it? That's why the 5C is so different from the 5, because Apple got cheaper? Well, actually, there's quite a bit more to it. The 5C actually shows clever marketing, even if it wasn't pulled off correctly. Look at the iPhone 5 and 5S. Do you see the difference? Well, on my models, the color. And the home button looks a little different on the 5S. Anything else? Nope, not really. And here's what Apple wanted to avoid. Back in 2011, with the release of the iPhone 4S, there was a very common sentiment being spread around. Even though the phone was significantly better than the 4 in a lot of ways, it looked exactly the same, with even fewer differences than the 5 and 5S. The antenna bands were placed on the sides instead of the top, and that was it. And as a result, a lot of people opted to buy the iPhone 4. Now, the iPhone 4S sold really well, but at release, many didn't see the point of getting it. In fact, if you look at articles from that time, a lot of people were disappointed with the lack of change. So modern Apple learned from this, and didn't want the same thing to happen here. They wanted obvious differentiation between their tiers of iPhones. Apple wanted you to know that people knew that you had the newest iPhone, and they did this by making it obvious. People knew if you had a 5C because it was brightly colored and looked completely different from anything else. And if you had a new iPhone that didn't look like the 5C, then it must be the 5S. Don't forget, for many, iPhones are kind of like a fashion statement. Apple's able to lure people in by having these flashy icons of technology. You look impressive if you have the newest iPhone, because it's something people recognize and desire for themselves. It's brilliant marketing, and it's something that Apple still does today. They always make their newer phones distinguishable from their last, even if it's relatively subtle. That way people see it, recognize it, and want it. And in many cases, buy it. And yeah, Apple still does this today. But to be sure, Apple has gotten better at this over the years. The iPhone 6s brought simply a new color, being rose gold, over the iPhone 6, but that was enough to make it stand out. The iPhone 7 changed the design very slightly, but it also added matte and jet black, two colors that weren't on any other iPhones. It also got rid of the physical home button, so if you held it and actually used it, it would be really obvious that this wasn't an iPhone 6. The iPhone 7 Plus also had a dual camera, which made it stand out even more. The iPhone 8 went to glass and had a new gold color, so it's pretty obvious that it isn't a 7. The iPhone 10 switched the camera orientation to vertical, so you won't get it mixed up with the 8. And that one I really like, because it's super obvious when someone has a 10. You know it because it has a vertical camera. Other iPhones have always had horizontal cameras. It's such a really simple thing, but it immediately makes it obvious someone has an iPhone 10. You say, well, what about the screen? The screen makes it more obvious. Don't forget, people usually have the screen facing them, so the chances of you seeing it are kind of unlikely compared to the chances of you seeing the back of the phone. While there are, of course, other reasons to make all these design changes, don't think for a second Apple isn't doing this intentionally. They absolutely are, and it's part of the reason that their phones always sell so well. On the other side of the coin, you have Samsung with the Galaxy S9. Frankly, from early reports, it doesn't seem to be selling very well, especially compared to how the Galaxy S8 sold. And why is that? Well, it's because the S8 brought a new design, making it easily distinguishable and therefore desirable. But the S9 really didn't. Everything added is very subtle, with the same basic design except for the dual camera on the Plus. And even that isn't super obvious. The way Samsung designs the back of their phones makes it not as obvious that there's two cameras there. And as a result of all this, the S9 isn't going to sell nearly as well as the S8. After all, it's basically the same phone, right? Well, no, but that's how people are going to think of it, because when you hold it in your hand and you look at it, it just seems the same as the S8, and the S8 is going to be cheaper, so why not buy the S8? It might seem like I'm getting off track here, but I'm not. The 5C represents the start of this marketing technique, and even though the 5C itself was mostly a flop, it still shows a significant shift in what Apple was doing. Apple knew if they kept the 5 around, it would take sales from the 5S. Why would you buy a more expensive phone when the cheaper looks the same and therefore basically is the same? Apple didn't want to split sales 
sales like that, and that's why they made the 5C to replace the 5. And it worked, in a way. The 5S did really well in sales, to the point that it was nearly always sold out in the beginning of its life cycle. I would say if Apple had kept the 5, the 5S probably would have done worse. But the 5C did poorly, and the iPhone 5 probably wouldn't have done as poorly. And Apple is actually going to be doing this again this year. Have you heard of the iPhone 10 being dead or dying? Well, it isn't, obviously. In fact, it's the best-selling smartphone out right now. But Apple is going to be replacing it in September. Not because the 10 is bad, but because they're releasing three new iPhones. An iPhone 11, or whatever they'll call it, a Plus model, and a cheaper budget model that looks like the 10 but is a bit bigger. In this lineup, there's no room for the iPhone 10 because it'll directly compete with the smartphones they're introducing. And if they kept it around, it would steal sales from everything else. Now, technically, all this isn't confirmed. The iPhone 10 might not be discontinued, but given what we know from rumors and how many reports saying the same thing we've gotten, I'm going to say that it's extremely likely this will happen. So Apple, in a way, is repeating what they did with the 5C, albeit to a less obvious extent. But at the end of the day, the 5C was mostly a flop. It didn't do well, at least by Apple's standards, and the reason for this is simple. It was too expensive. Apple was trying to appeal to kids and budget users and the more creative crowd, if that's what you want to call it, with their flashy colors and plastic. It's actually a great corner of the market to go after, but again, it needs to be cheaper. Parents might think, oh hey, there's a good phone for Jimmy, but then they see the price. As time went on, the 5C actually did start to do a little bit better as it went down in cost, and therefore there was more of a significant gap between it and the top iPhone. The iPhone 5C is much different than the iPhone 5 because it represents a completely different approach in marketing and business. The iPhone 5 was a simple upgrade, while the 5C felt like more of a downgrade but didn't have the price reduction to make that okay. The 5C was a good idea in theory, and it'd be kind of nice if Apple tried it again but with a better price in mind. And I mean, they kind of are later this year with a cheaper iPhone. But what if I told you that in kind of a way, they did the 5C again, and they did it so well that people didn't even really notice. The iPhone SE is essentially the 5C 2.0, and it's better in every single way. It has a more premium design being that of the 5S, so it's appealing to those who want an iPhone. It was actually a really good deal at launch, being just as fast and nearly just as good as the iPhone 6S, the newest phone at the time. It was cheap, starting at $450, and now in 2018 only costing $350. And to add to this, it was released after the 6S by a fair few months. This way, they wouldn't split sales. The SC, in my opinion, is essentially the iPhone 5C done right. It didn't replace any older models, and was able to sell to budget users without the appearance of being a budget phone. So I've rambled on a lot here, so I'll kind of leave you all with this. If you had to summarize this whole video in a couple sentences, it would be pretty simple. The iPhone 5 and the iPhone 5C are different because they both perfectly show the differing directions of the Steve Jobs and Tim Cook eras of Apple. While on the surface they look similar besides the plastic and aluminum, going deeper we see there's so much more to it than just that. Now that said, I think I'm pretty much done here. The iPhone 5 and 5C are two very different phones because they have two very different mindsets behind each of them. But that's my opinion, and I really want to see what you all have to say. Hopefully I've made some sense in this video and it wasn't just me rambling for however long it is. And I, again, I really want to hear you guys' thoughts on this. If you found this video interesting, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. If you want even more tech in your life, you can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram, links below. And if you want to help out the channel, you could always bookmark the Amazon affiliate link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.